Our scripture reading will be read by Val. Psalm 121, Assurance of God's Protection, a Song of Ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, Monika will sing a solo for us, I Lift My Eyes Up. Wouldn't it be nice to get on a plane and fly someplace far away? Those of us with a bit of wanderlust are longing for the day that we can travel again. As the COVID restrictions are loosening and more and more of us are fully vaccinated, people are starting to at least imagine traveling to 
visit with friends or family in other cities or provinces, or to spend a few days relaxing at a cottage. This summer, we probably have to settle for a vicarious trip to Japan through the eyes of the Olympic athletes and the journalists, a place where many of us will never get to see for our lifetime. If we could only be in the same time zone as they are, we'd even enjoy it more, wouldn't we? Life is often described as being on a journey, a journey that can be quite challenging at times, with unexpected and unwanted surprises. Perhaps you remember a particularly stressful time when you've called out to God in anguish, saying, where will my help come from? Psalm 121 has been dubbed the Psalm of Sojourners or Travelers. It's a psalm that is almost as well loved as Psalm 23. I remember we used to sing Unto the Hills at the Christian camp that I went to each summer. Sometimes we would sing it around a campfire or in the dining room or on the dock or at Chapel Point. In every place we sang it, we could look upwards and see evidence of God's creation all around us. It's a psalm that proclaims with assurance that God will protect us on our life journey, wherever we go. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly put the psalms in context for us. The book of Psalms can be found by opening the Bible right in the middle. It's a collection of hymns, prayers, laments, and poems written by many people over the span of about a thousand years. The Psalms address almost every situation in life and the full spectrum of our own emotions, our joys and sorrows, our doubts and our fears. Martin Luther referred to the Psalms as a mini Bible because within its 150 chapters, it gives us an overview of salvation history. The Psalms are lyric poetry with shorter sentences and lots of me uh, metaphor and parallelism. And although scholars know the historical context of many of the Psalms, they're written without any reference to a specific historical event. This is what makes the, the Psalms accessible for our worship so many centuries later. Initially, the Psalms were used to teach the Israelites how to pray, teaching how to repent when they'd sinned or been caught in sin, how to rejoice in God's goodness how to thank him for his salvation, and how to approach God when they were in the depths of despair. Interestingly, more than one-third of the Psalms are songs of lament. They are individual and community complaints to God. Comparing that with our own personal prayer life, that sounds about right, doesn't it? The Psalms of Lament model for us how to bring our anger and frustration and disappointment and all of our complaints to God in prayer. We will notice that the psalmists don't hold back when lamenting to God. For God can handle the good, the bad, and the very bad, even those things that we think we dare not say. The book of Psalms has been dubbed the hymn book of the Old Testament. And in the context of corporate worship, the Psalms were meant to be sung or prayed rather than read. So the Israelites would have learned the Psalms by hearing them read, and they would have committed them to memory through much repetition. In the rest of scripture, we can read the stories of events. But in the Psalms, we see the personal struggle that the people of God experience in those stories. We get to see David pray while he is cowering in fear in a cave. 
And we witness Moses' private prayers in his wanderings throughout the wilderness. We can often join David as he communes with God in prayer. It's been said in the Bible, God talks to us. In the Psalms, we learn how to talk to God. Psalm 121 is one of 15 Psalms of Ascent. They were called Psalms of Ascent because they were sung as the pilgrims were traveling to Jerusalem to participate in the three most important Jewish festivals of the year. Knowing that Jerusalem sits on a hill, we can envision the pilgrims' destination from every direction. And the only way to get there is to go up, to ascend to the hill of the Lord. It's likely that the sojourner to Jerusalem felt a mixture of anxiety and longing, like most of us do as we prepare to go on a journey. For some of us, traveling away to a new place brings with it the fear of the unknown. For others, we can hardly wait to see new places and the longing for something new overshadows any fear that we might have. The pilgrim's journey was from their familiar homes to Mount Zion, in the holy city, Jerusalem, where they longed to be, and their arrival there marked the end of their journey. Going up to Jerusalem was like making a sacred pilgrimage for the Israelites. But setting off on this pilgrimage was not quite as easy as hopping onto the well-lit 407 and away you go. It was fraught with potential danger from unseen adversaries, which the psalmist addresses later in the psalm. At first glance, this poem is a simple one, consisting of four stanzas of two lines each. I invite you to take your Bible and follow along as we look more carefully at each stanza, asking God to help us to understand its teaching and to apply it to our own lives. In verse 1, the writer states, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? The Hebrew word help here means asking for help in a life-threatening situation finding the one who would be a strong presence and who would protect and guard the traveler. The word help comes from the same root word that we see in Genesis chapter 2, where we read, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the human should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. It's useful to know that pagans in the ancient Near East believed that the small g gods dwelt in the hills and the mountains. Perhaps the most well-known example of this is Mount Olympus, the home of the gods of Greek mythology. By contrast, the Israelites, who believed in the one god, Yahweh, knew that help couldn't come from the hills because the hills were likely hiding some threat, like a wild animal or a vengeful pagan deity, or an unruly mob, or a desperate vagabond ready to harm or to kill. So to answer his own question in verse 2, the psalmist looked beyond the hills, to the one who created the hills, to the one who created the universe, and pointed to the power and protection of the Lord Yahweh, who created the heaven and the earth. If the Lord Yahweh had the power to create everything, then the Israelites trusted that the covenantal God would provide help to his own people. In verse 2, it's important to point out that the expression, the heaven and the earth, is one of several literary motifs in this psalm. It's called a merism. A merism is a pair of words that are opposite in meaning and so set the inclusive boundaries of an idea. So when the psalmist says the Lord made heaven and earth, it means that the Lord made everything that exists in between the heaven and the earth as well. 
So in saying heaven and earth, he meant Yahweh made the whole created order. Then in verse 3, do you notice that the voice changes from I to you? He will not let your foot be moved. The construction of this sentence using the word not signals in Hebrew that this is a prayer. What it means is this. Though the way is treacherous and rocky at times, I pray that the Lord Yahweh will not let you falter or fall. Rather, I pray that he will be your keeper, your guardian, your guide, your protector, and your savior. If you find yourself fearful or doubting God's providence and care, may I suggest saying aloud the thing that you fear. For example, I'm afraid of what the future holds for me. And then repeat the psalm aloud. If you have the psalm memorized then, it will often come to mind exactly when you need it, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And it will provide the assurance of God's protection that you long to hear. Verse 4 says, He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The word slumber refers to that deep sleep that we sometimes refer to as the sleep of the dead, the kind of sleep where you don't even remember dreaming. It means deep restorative sleep. You may remember the time when the god Baal did not light the fire on top of Mount Carmel. Elijah taunted his followers and said, maybe your God is sleeping and must be awakened. You see, it was the small G gods who were thought to need to sleep or who were thought to be caught sleeping. By contrast, the psalmist affirms the Lord Yahweh does not slumber or sleep. The Lord Yahweh, the God of both individual and nation, will keep us safe day and night. If he is watching over us, then when we lay down to sleep, we can release all our fears and anxieties to him, sleeping peacefully, knowing that he promises to watch over us. In verse 5, we read the Lord is our keeper. This means he is our guardian, our lookout, our companion. He is the one who has our best interests at heart. He is trustworthy. Do you believe this? The Lord is our shade on our right hand, evokes the imagery of a raptor covering its chick with its wings. He protects us from the scorching and burning heat of the sun, and likewise, the scorching and burning heat of adversity. Will you invite him to be your keeper through the dark valleys of life? In verse 6, we find another merism, the sun and the moon. Both the sun and the moon were thought of as being deities who could harm people. But the psalmist says that neither the sun nor the moon will harm us. In fact, nothing will harm us. Regardless of the time of day or night, the expression means that nothing shall strike us at all. In verse 7, he will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Even though evil might come near you, the Lord Yahweh will arm you against evil and protect you from all harm and every possible threat. It helps us to know that the ancient Near Eastern people often left the protection of the walled city to go out into the fields and pastures to work. And then they returned in the evening to the shelter of the city walls. We would say today that they were commuters 
So the passage ends with a final merism. The Lord will keep your life. He will keep your going out and your coming in, meaning in every situation, on all occasions, constantly, from the beginning of your day when you leave the city walls to the end of your day when you come back, you will have God's protection. It also means from the dawning of your life until the sunset of your life, he will keep your life. How awesome is this promise? The last stanza of this psalm in verses 7 and 8 serves as a blessing or a benediction. It's a promise that the Lord will keep us from all evil. He will keep our lives. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in from this time on and forevermore. The promise begins now and continues not until the end of time, but continues without end, because God is our portion forever and forever. What promise can be better than this one? So what is the message of this psalm for us today in our context? Psalm 121 begs the question, in whom or in what have you placed your trust? Do you know the Lord Yahweh personally, the one who has promised to protect you? I think about this question when we have gathered to mark the end of a dear one's life's journey, to say goodbye, and to witness to the Christian's hope in the resurrection. I often say to those who gathered at a funeral or at a graveside committal service, that at some point in the future, death will come to each one of us too. Personally, when I say that, I'm reminded that at some future time, someone else will be officiating at my funeral service. This thought is deeply humbling. During fun funerals and committal services, people take the time to reflect on some of these deeper questions, to reflect on who or what really matters to them most in life when it's all been said and done, and to hear anew the promises of the one in whom we're invited to put our trust. Here's a poignant question for self-reflection. Do we find ourselves lured by the things of the world that temporarily capture our interest or our attention, only to discover that we're hoping and longing for things that will not last and can never satisfy? Do we depend on our own abilities and strive for success in our own strength, trusting in the gifts that we've been entrusted with without fully trusting in the giver of those gifts? In the big picture of life, what matters most to us? Some of us may have come to the realization that we have settled for a second best. And if we're honest, we know that our allegiance is divided. We have succumbed to the small g gods of this world, the lure of what this world has to offer. We've taken our eyes off of the source of our assuredness and we've looked to other mountains that beckon us. Beloved, as long as we have breath, it's not too late to stop, take stock, and change priorities. As we continue life's journey, let's refocus on the one in whom we can put our trust. Let's refocus on where our help comes from. Let's look beyond the hills to the only one who can keep us from stumbling. In doing this, we will be able to declare with confidence 
along with the Apostle Paul. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May this be our testimony and our witness. To God be the glory. Amen.